Advanced Financial Accounting. In this presentation, we will discuss eliminating intercompany transactions. The objective will be to have an overview of the intercompany transactions, the types of intercompany transactions, and the basic elimination entry for those intercompany transactions. Get ready to account with Advanced Financial Accounting. Intercompany transactions. We're going to start off by listing the intercompany transactions as we list them. Remember, our objective is in essence to remove the intercompany transactions. Therefore, we want to think about what are the intercompany transactions, what category do they fit into, and then what are going to be the effect on the financial statements, and then of course, how can we reverse them. So if we have the intercompany reciprocal accounts uh, is a type of transactions, for example, we could have accounts receivable and accounts payable involved, meaning one company, if we think about a parent subsidiary relationship that we're going to be consolidating, we might have a receivable on the books for the parent and a payable on the books for uh, the subsidiary that we would then have to reverse. Now, you might say, as you think about these, it, there could be other like notes payable and uh, receivable and so on that are reciprocal. These are pretty basic, pretty easy for the most part, because they should be equal and opposite on the two sets of books and therefore an easier thing to remove. As you think about the receivable and payable, however, you might say, hey, wait, what about the other things that could be included in that type of transaction, such as possibly inventory or something like that, a sale that's going to be taking place. So we, we're, when we think about the reversing entries, we may want to think about them a little bit separate, like basically separating those out. In other words, we're not typically, we may not just say, hey, this is going to be the, the actual journal entry that took place and reverse it in, in that format. We might reverse, in other words, these accounts and then deal with the other side of the accounts that could be affected, the inventory, the sales, the uh, cost of goods sold. So these then are usually going to be one of the easier type of things that, um, that we, can, we can reverse. Hopefully in, for example, the accounts receivable subledger, we would show, we would show that it was an intercompany sale by who it, who was owing us money and the subledger for AP would show uh, who money is owed to and we could reverse that out. Then we have the inventory transactions. Now these are going to be a little bit more difficult and again you might say hey there's some overlap here. If there's an inventory transaction isn't it quite possible that in that inventory transaction sales was affected for example uh, in the inventory transaction and accounts receivable and whatnot. Well, that could be the case, but again, we could kind of separate those those items out. So when the inventory transactions, we could we could try to group together, you know, the effect of the inventory going from, let's say, a parent to the subsidiary or subsidiary to the parent. And then, of course, we got to think about how we're going to reverse those. That's going to be more complicated because when you think about inventory transactions, then you got to think about whether or not the inventory is still on the books of the parent or subsidiary and whether or not it was sold when you have that and then the case of the markups that could happen with them it could be a little bit more confusing to do that reversal process so we'll think about that later then we got the fixed asset transactions so we could have uh, transactions intercompany transactions related to fixed assets and again th they're a little bit more complex than uh, other types of transactions possibly than just uh, an intercompany reciprocal accounts because of the other things that could be involved there. We could have depreciation, gains and losses and what not involved with those type of intercompany transactions and then intercompany indebtedness, which could be a little bit more difficult than simply the reciprocal account because of course we have other things that could be involved such as the calculation of interest. We're gonna be focusing in on first now, we've, we've taken a look at these to some degree in the past. Our focus now is gonna be on the uh, inventory transactions at this time. Okay, arm's length transactions, related party transaction. These are, we're gonna compare and contrast these, these two things. And when you think about an arm's length transaction from an accounting standpoint, you're typically thinking about a transaction where you're saying, hey, this transaction happened within the market. There's a market transaction. These are unrelated people. And therefore, when you think about the price of the exchange that took place, you would assume there was an equal and opposite exchange of goods and services, assuming that both parties have the information necessary in order to make a, a good transaction. So if it's a related party transaction, then all that kind of goes out the window. We have a problem then from an accounting standpoint, because now you have a related party transaction, we can't depend on the transaction itself. We can't depend on two independent people being self-interested, resulting in, in a transaction that would be at market or fair value, and that's gonna be a problem. 
Obviously, that's going to be one of the issues that are, will be involved if you're talking about parent-subsidiary relationships and transactions between like parents and subsidiaries. It's just the same thing as, of course, if you had a transaction between uh, siblings or spouses or whatnot or, you know, cousins and stuff. You know, you're just like that the transaction kind of loses its v validity in some degree if a parent gives something to that they might sell something to their child. But of course, it might not be for the, the same market price. We're not if something was sold from a parent to a sibling, we're much more likely to question the market value of that transaction. Part of it might have been a gift, right? Which there's nothing wrong with that. It's just we can't rely on the market to basically tell us the value of, of the item. Whereas if the parent sold it to a third party, sold the same property to a third party, then of course we would say, well, the two people are self-interested. They 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 must have negotiated, you know, what you would think it would be a market price. So arm's length transaction is what we typically want to see in accounting. And when we don't see it, then we're we're going to have to, you know, think about what we're going to do about that. So transactions with parties outside the the uh, economic entity. So again, of course, that means it's going to be someone unrelated to the entity. So not a subsidiary, not a, you know, controlled entity, uh, typically, uh, are the type of transactions included in the income statement. So that's basically what we want, of course, on the income statement, we want transactions included on the income statement. If you're thinking about a parent subsidiary type of relationship, uh, and, and if you're thinking about a consolidation statement too, we're, we're thinking about transactions that we want, uh, that, that were made to out people outside uh, on an arm's length transaction. That's basically what we want to include. The uh, related party transactions we typically want to eliminate. The consolidated financial statement should report the, the interactions with parties outside the organization. Related party transactions, which you can also call non arm's length transactions, so non-arm's length transactions, intercompany transactions uh, generally need to be eliminated during consolidation. So when we think about our consolidation process, the related party transaction, non-arm's length transactions are going to be those intercompany transactions. And of course, those are the things that we need to eliminate. We can't have those being reflected in uh, the consolidated financial statements. Possible intercompany transactions that would need elimination. There could be sales and purchases that were intercompany, parent to subsidiary, subsidiary to parent, there could be interest, there could be debt, you know, from one to the other resulting in interest, there could be dividends, there could be security holdings. So these are types of things that could, you know, come about as intercompany transactions, that we'll then we're then going to have to consider how what's the effect on the financial statements and how can we basically eliminate them. Intercompany transactions are eliminated, whether the subsidiary is wholly owned or partially owned. So you might have a question in your mind, you might be saying, okay, well, what if P owns S, but you know, to have a controlling interest, they only need over 51%, but they don't need 100%. So what if there's going to be uh, the, these intercompany transactions with like a, a controlling interest, that's not a wholly owned uh, subsidiary? Well, we're still we're still going to basically remove, we're still going to remove the intercompany transactions. So when we do the consolidation, we're going to say consolidating and say, say the parent and the subsidiary will have have the total transactions, then we're going to remove, you know, entirely the intercompany transactions that, that could be between uh, those two entities, we're not going to remove in other words, like if there's a 70% interest uh, in the parent or the subsidiary, it's not like we're just going to remove the 70% control and interest, we're going to remove the intercompany transaction, the entire amount, and you might justify that by saying well look again the consolidated financial statements are there to to represent the assets and liabilities that the owner has based or the parent company generally we're thinking about the parent company when we're looking about at the consolidated financial statements has control over right and the income statement represents uh you know the the performance of those net assets that basically the parent company has uh control over and so and from that perspective, it would make sense to basically remove the entire amount of the intercompany transaction because the parent would have control, in essence, ultimate control at the end of the day to allocate assets and, and resources. So, you know, you wouldn't want to allocate assets and resources to yourself if you have uh, control over to do so. It would make sense to eliminate the intercompany transactions. Intercompany loans. So if there's intercompany loans, fairly straightforward to take take off the, the loan amount, right? Because then you would have the loan payable on one side of the books, whether it be parent or subsidiary, 
and the receivable on the other side. So the loan payable, that's a liability account. We would remove it by doing the opposite thing to it, debiting it. And the, the, pay, the receivable is going to be an asset account on either the parent or the subsidiary. It would have a debit balance. We would take it off the books with a credit. Then we have the sale from P to S uh, to outsider. So this is one we're going we're gonna to spend a little bit more time on. What if something happened where the parent sold to the subsidiary? Then the question is, well, did the subsidiary resell it or have they not yet resold it? Because if they're still holding on to it, there's going to be a different treatment. So if there was a sale from, say, P to S and then S sold to an outsider, then you're still going to have to remove the, the revenue on the sale from P to S, right? So you're going to have to remove because the sale from P to S wasn't really a sale to an, an arm's length sale. And then you're going to have to remove the cost of goods sold. In essence, the cost of goods sold that was from S to the outsider because the cost of goods sold would be overstated there. So this one gets a little bit more complicated because you could think about this as reversing uh, the, the full intercompany transaction. Or you could do what we're going to end up doing, which is kind of netting it out and think about how, how you can reverse the thing as efficiently basically as possible so we'll spend a little bit more time on these shortly then we have the sale from p to s and then s has not sold it yet so what if you sold from the parent to the subsidiary and then the subsidiary is just holding on to it well in that case then no sale really took place right because s still didn't sell sell the inventory so it went just from p to s the sale is basically you know, kind of like not a legitimate sale from an arm's length transaction perspective. So we would reverse the revenue. So we're going to debit the revenue to take the revenue off the books, reverse the cost of goods sold, credit cost of goods sold because it's a debit account. So we'll credit it to take it off the books. And then we'll credit the inventory. We're going to credit the inventory for the gross profit uh, realized. So that's going to be the gross profit going off the books. Now you might think, you know, why don't I, why aren't I just reversing the entire transaction, which, you know, the normal transaction would be, a, you know, a, a debit to say cash, a credit to revenue, a debit to cost of goods sold, a credit to inventory. Because the other side of the books, you know, on, that would be what P would be recording. And then S would be recording what? They would be recording inventory going up on their side for the revenue portion. And they would be recording the cash going down. So the cash would net each other out and then the revenue would kind of, so you, you could see this is kind of like the net they would have to do. This is the most efficient way for us to reverse this rather than reversing the entire journal entry on P and S's books. So let's, we'll spend a little bit more time to kind of mold that concept over. So we get, once again, going to spend some time here where we have this concept, the sale from P to S, then to an outsider where we're reducing the revenue with a debit and reducing the cost of goods sold. And then the sale from P to S, S has not yet sold it. And then of course we can, we can apply some of the same principles to what if it was the other way, this is going to be what we're calling a downstream sale went from parent to subsidiary. And then what happens if it's an upstream sale subsidiary to parent. So similar concepts can, can apply. So we'll start to mold that over in future presentations.